Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the podcast. I'm here with one of the most interesting young journalists uh, out there today, uh, Aaron Severium. Uh, Aaron, how are you doing? Good, Richard. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm glad to have you on. Uh, so can you just uh, give people your background a little bit? Uh, who are you? Where where do you come from? And you're currently employed by the Washington Free Beacon. So how did you get there? Sure. Uh, so my life story in like three minutes is I grew up my whole life in Chevy Chase, Maryland, which is basically Washington, D.C. I was raised a pretty normal, moderate liberal by two moderate Democrat parents, um, went to relatively progressive schools my whole life. Uh, I attended Yale uh, for college uh, from 2014 to 2018. And those were the years where Yale really experienced its kind of own ideological transformation that prefigured in many ways the revolution of 2020. Um, all the stuff you saw playing out at the New York Times and in other elite institutions across the country post Floyd really played out first um, on a number of college campuses, but in particular Yale. I was the opinion editor of the Yale Daily News uh, when the Halloween incident with Nicholas Christakis happened, uh, where he was encircled in a courtyard and attacked by uh, shrieking students, uh, many of them, if you, as you have, uh, I think, importantly noted, were women. Um, perhaps we can talk about why later. Uh, but in any case, experiences like that uh, made me, I would say, more right-wing or at least more concerned about the effects that what we now call wokeness is, was going to have on our society, especially once these kids graduated college. Um, I remember predicting to my parents, guys, this stuff is going to be really bad. You're not ready for it. And they were kind of like, okay, come on, Aaron. It's just a few college kids being crazy. Yeah. 2020 comes around and they basically conceded. Yeah, you're right, Aaron. Uh, this stuff is not going to go away. It's actually a big problem. Um, but in any case, so I graduated from Yale in 2018. Um, I worked at the American interest, which is kind of a centrist, uh, publication now, now defunct publication for two years as an editor came over to the Free Beacon, initially was just editing there, and then decided, you know what, I want to try my hand at reporting. Um, and so for the past almost two years now, I've been reporting, not exclusively, but mainly on the culture war. Yeah, so I mean, your background, I mean, going to Yale as an undergrad is very interesting to me, because I did not go to, you know, any, I didn't go to any selective college. I didn't know anyone who went to a, a selective college growing up. I don't know what it was, what it would have been like to be the kind of person who could have got into a selective college while I was a, a teenager. I was living in a completely different world. Um, can you talk about, just talk about that a little bit? Um, you know, how do you think you got into Yale? Because you're, you're, a, you're a white male, you're not a liberal activist. Maybe you were at the time. And so, you know, the, the odds are stacked against you and it's not all just standardized tests. So like, was this something you was getting into an Ivy league school, something you focused on, you worked hard or how did you go about that? Yeah, I worked hard. I think it was a few factors, honestly. Um, and I had no legacy advantage either. I'll say so extra impressive that I got in as a white male, but, um, you know, when you get in, sometimes the admissions officer who was in charge of your application will give you a little note, more or less saying why you got in. Um, and mine basically said it was because my essays were interesting and unique. Um, I think what it was was that I had spent uh, a week as a secular uh, normie Jew, I'd spent a week with extremely devout uh, Catholics in the mountains of Wyoming uh, in a Latin immersion program where we spoke classical Latin. The goal was to teach you how to speak ancient Latin. Uh, I got to this program. It was culture shock. I'd never met people who were serious social conservatives or Catholics, certainly not conservative enough to want to learn how to speak Latin. I was just there because I liked AP Latin and thought it was cool. They were there for religious reasons. Um, it was a pretty eye-opening experience for me. I think it made me a lot more uh, empathetic with uh, people that kind of secular cosmopolitan elites in D.C. are inclined to dismiss as backwards rubes or deplorables. Um, and my essay was basically about that. Um, I suspect that that was, you know, unique enough that they took notice. Um, I had obviously good grades and SAT scores. My high school was also pretty small. 
um, which meant I was able to really stand out, right? It was a decent high school, but not like amazing. So if you were a kid who had, you know, close to perfect SATs and really high grades um, and got really nice recommendations from your teachers, that actually meant a little more coming from my high school than it might have meant coming from some other places. So I think it was a combination of all those factors. But also, look, as people say, it's a crapshoot. And it would not surprise me if I would not have gotten in had I applied with the exact same resume, uh, you know, two, three, certainly five years later. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it makes sense to me that they would see your your writing as good. Um, and so you you, you uh, go in knowing you wanted to be a journalist. You said you wrote for you were an editor for the school paper. Yeah, I didn't know I wanted to be a journalist, although I had done some journalism in high school, like working for my high school paper too. Um, so certainly of an interest of mine. Once I started writing these opinion columns for the Yale Daily News and uh, tasted the thrill of pissing people off with hot takes, uh, something that I know uh, you is, is near, <laughs> near your, your own heart, that. Richard, uh, I decided, oh, wow, yeah, this is fun. So initially, when I graduated, I wanted to do more of the opinion and kind of cultural commentary stuff. And to some extent, I still do. Like, I, I think I will go back to that at some point. But, but I also just have discovered over the past two years in the course of doing reporting that there is, I think, a lot of value to uh, reporting, and in particular, conservative or, or what you might call center right or heterodox uh, dissident reporting, um, because everyone on the right wants to, you know, write essays and have their uh, their grand theories about political economy and the American right taken very seriously from the time they're young. And the problem is that a, when you're you know, 22, you don't really know anything, and b, there's there's a there's a surplus of that writing already. Um, realistically, you know, you're not going to be that much smarter or, or say something new that someone like Ross Douthat or Christopher Caldwell hasn't already said. Maybe you will. I mean, but it's hard, right? I would say, actually, you're probably one of the few people who in the past year, few years has managed to say something new. Um, most people on the right just do the opinion commentary stuff and don't say anything new. Yeah, I think that's um, right. And I think one thing I'm glad is I, I started when I was older. If I tried to start, say, your age, I just came out of college and was writing out, they would have been, it would have been horrifying. I mean, it would have Yeah, been, and you, you know, <laughs> you have, crazy. you have, you have, right, uh, uh, you're, you're kind of overeducated. You have like, you know, PhDs and law degrees. Yeah, so and you, also so people mature, kind of, right. Yeah. People will take you seriously. Emotionally. Maturing yeah. emotionally through having yeah. built up knowledge. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It, it, yeah, no, although completely. you're you're more you're more mature than I was. I was at twenty, but it, I, yeah, I think I think young people shouldn't probably uh, yeah. should be an op ed columnist. I, I think that's a, right. That's a good... So so I and 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 but the bigger issue I think in some ways is that a lot of what young conservatives are animated by now are these culture war issues, and they tend to take this very apocalyptic tone that the sky is falling, that we're all going to be you know living under the woke regime in twenty years. And look, I was like this too. But what they're not always good at is spelling out or finding the precise examples of how that ideology is actually manifesting in day-to-day -day life, how it's affecting people. You know, it is true that at the end of the day, it does not matter in and of itself if college students say stupid shit in class or if even if they hound out professors from academia. I mean, it makes a difference, but it's really pretty marginal. What does start to matter is when these woke bureaucrats run public health departments and decide to allocate COVID treatments on the basis of race, which has actually happened and nobody else was really talking about. Um, and so that's where I think I kind of provide a kind of service or, or occupy a journalistic niche that I don't see many other people either on the right who are doing this kind of young, you know, opinion commentary or on the left that these mainstream publications like the New York Times doing, it's just something not many people talk about. And the people who do talk about it often aren't particularly, if I may say so, they aren't always all that smart. They often don't have, aren't well-educated. They do tend to shoot from the hip. They don't care about facts. And so it's rare to see someone who will cover something like say, race-based treatment of COVID drugs or overtly discriminatory hiring policies who also is like not a crank and has an IQ above 120.
Yeah, exactly. And this is, this is, I, I agree with all that. And this is sort of what, what drew me to your work. You know, I think if there's more people that have sort of filled a niche and who we, you know, we, if we, uh, if we could clone, it would be, it would be good. Um, and, um, you know, that are sort of becoming dispensable. I think it's you and I think it's Chris Rufo and you guys are, you guys are different on these identity issues. Um, but you're doing something and I, I don't think you've exalt, you've like completely filled that niche because there's just so much out there. So when I see your work, you know, I'm just like, okay, so he's, uh, so you've done stuff on Pfizer and Starbucks. Um, my model of the world, and you tell me if this is right, is that there's just like an endless amount of stuff out there that left wing institutions do that if you shine the light on it would embarrass them, would potentially get the, uh, would bring bad PR, would get the attention of politicians, um, would, you know, would create costs to doing this stuff. And the universe of conservative journalists or nonprofits, people looking, looking into this is just too small. And the ones who do find stuff, it's, it's often, you know, they can be ignored because they're crazy or they're, you know, they're just, you know, they're completely discrediting in some other way. They can't just write a calm article just explaining what's going on. Did you see this uh, controversy <coughs> about this fashion brand? I don't know how, what is it called, Basinaga or something? Uh, I saw there was a controversy. I confess I haven't followed it closely enough to have any kind of opinion on it. <laughs> so these, uh, this fashion brand, they had these kids like there's like this, <laughs> there's this, like this, this ad campaign where like these kids with uh, uh have these like bondage teddy bears, and then I think it's like. A different ad. It's a different ad where, like, there in the background, there's a, a Supreme Court case that had to do with child pornography, and it's like showing. So it's like, oh, they're sort of they're trying to be edgy. I think they're trying to wink at this, you know, child pornography stuff, and like, it's like became the biggest thing. It, it, it's like you know, the people are harassing uh, uh, the company, and it's like, okay, like maybe you know, maybe you could investigate like whether whether the person who's behind this is a pedophile. It's not crazy to think that maybe maybe they are, but it, but like you know, the brand like apologized. They're like suing. I don't know. They're suing somebody who was like involved in the campaign. So like, you know, they're completely apologetic. They're not standing up and saying, Oh, this is okay. Or this is good. Um, or anything like that. And this is just getting so much attention. And it's like, you know, it, you know, the facts take them as they are. They, they don't matter. Right. So it's like, there's the right wing people that they, they find things where it's like, you know, it just, they're, they're max, they're optimizing for how can I anger an audience? Right. They're not, they're not optimizing for, what is a problem in the world that I can go fix, even in the universe of the, the, the so-called woke issues? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I would say, you know, you mentioned me and Chris Rufo. I'd add my friend Nate Hawkman, I think, has done some pretty good reporting and shined a light on some of this stuff. Um, and look, I have a number of colleagues at the Free Beacon, my boss, obviously, Eliana Johnson, but, you know, all sorts of other people um, I could name, like Joe Simonson, Andrew Kerr, uh, Patrick Hoff, who's now at Fox News. There are people who are out there, and that's just a few of them, who are doing, I think, good, serious reporting. I don't want to, you know, make it seem like it's just me and Chris, right? But you're right. I think your model of the world is basically right, that that there's way too much of this stuff um, for just a few people to uncover it all. You know, there's not an entire well-funded nonprofit complex uh dedicated to unearthing instances of insane lefty wokeism, or at least not dedicated to doing so competently, because as you say, a lot of the, the so-called conservative whistleblowers or, or journalists just get caught up in these insane fantasies like Pizzagate or whatever. And, and you know, I realize that's pretty fringe, but I see... Look, I've seen relatively serious people or people who pretend to be serious retweeting folks who were involved in Pizzagate. And look, those folks may be right some of the time about discrete issues. It's not even like I'm I'm not saying that like everything Jack Posobiec tweets is wrong per se, but like I really don't think he should be the one in charge of exposing the the left wing rot in our institutions, right? You do not want to surrender that job to people like him. That is a bad idea. Yeah, I, yeah, I think that's I think that's right. And of course, there are you know good conservative journalists out there. Like you know, the, 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 so we're not saying that, you know you're the only person in the world doing anything close to this. Um, but if you're just sort of looking at conservatives and liberals, I mean the the sort of the battle of the bulge. Like the, it's if you just look at it as like okay, there's a uh, constellation of nonprofits and journalists who are just going out there looking for stuff that can embarrass the other side, not even just the point of embarrassing the other side, but affect some kind of change. 
And you think about that on the right and the left, it's, it's probably like, you know, orders of magnitude. It's probably 10 to one or, or 100 to one or, or something. I remember there was this, uh, uh, case that I think it was the third circuit. It was about like, you know, some, uh, liberal, you know, liberals were uh, suing some charter school because they wanted to have a boy's uniform and a girl's uniform where the girls had to wear skirts. And I looked at the, <laughs> I looked at the amicus briefs and at the beginning of the court case, I tweeted about this. They list the uh, amicus briefs on each side. And it's like, it's just this like one charter school, like in the middle of nowhere. It's like, no, not important. And like, you know, it has like four people, four groups like filing an amicus brief in favor. And the other side is like pages long of the amicus brief. It's like the Jewish right. Center for Equality, like LGBT for progress. It's, it's like just group yeah. after group after right. group. Right. That's lawyers or whoever could write these briefs. Um, and it's just like knows about the cases and on top of it. And it's just for this little, little school that just wants to, you know, have girls wear skirts and, you know, not even a Christian school. It was like, you know, just kind of some kind of, you know, uh, uh, traditional kind of, uh, moral, uh, culture. And I, I was just blown away by this. And I think just like everything in life is, is sort of like this. And, you know, the question is sort of like, how do you, how do you fix this? How do you create more people who, who care about these issues from the other side? Yeah. Um, how do you, how do you, Fix it. Well, look, I, I do think sunlight is a useful disinfectant. Um, and right, but, but how do we how do we find more right, sunlight? Right. How do we find well, so more look, people look, 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 look. So, so, a couple answers. One is that I do think that well, Chris Rufo and myself are not sufficient. Simply taking that first step that Chris did and actually both naming the problem, critical race theory, and then exposing some really high profile instances of it, put it on people's radar and did start to kind of shape the priorities of a lot of conservative institutions. Um, for, just for example, uh, yeah, a Heritage Foundation isn't a reporting outlet, and so it's not exactly surfacing a lot of this stuff, but I've now seen them both using Chris's language and also talking more about these issues. And look, you know, Manhattan Institute has hired a lot of people to do work. On, they hired Chris. They hired other people like our friend Charles Lehman. Um, AI even has hired some folks who are more into the culture war stuff. So you do see how if, if a few people do it and it makes a splash, you can get some other wealthy people with resources to, to go along. That's, I think, the first step. You're right, of course, that that's insufficient. Um, you know, in terms of the creating a broader infrastructure, I'm not sure there's a great answer. Uh, and part of why there's not a great answer is because, as you and others have written about, there are legal and cultural incentives that can make it hard to actually go and, you know, do this sort of thing unless you're already kind of ensconced safely in a uh, right wing news outlet that's funded by a you know rich right wing dude, right? Like there are there, there's a reason why this isn't getting done at the New York Times, and there's a reason why lots of other institutions uh, aren't willing to go there. It's in part because there is a whole constellation of legal incentives in part created by civil rights laws um, and other things uh, that have kind of just shaped the entire system to be very sensitive to the priorities of progressive activists. Um, and I do think that in the long run, that does put some limits on just how many people you're going to get, A, doing this kind of work, and B, doing it in venues that will reach beyond the right-wing ecosystem. I don't know if you how far beyond the right-wing ecosystem you need to reach, right? You know, if, as long as, say, if, if President Ron DeSantis, uh, inshallah, in the future, you know, uh, reads the free beacon, well, okay, like, then, then you know, <laughs> that's, that's kind of all you need. But I, I do think, ultimately, there's only so much any politician can do, uh, it's not, I think, in the long run enough for it to just be the right who cares about this. You do need to have some moderates and centrists who realize, oh, it's a problem and course correct. Um, I do think there's a limit to just what the right can do. Uh, and it's tougher to make inroads, I think, with those people um, because there's this kind of deep 
you know, well entrenched cathedral of interests. Um, yeah. So opposed to that. Yeah. You know, part of me thinks, you know, part of me, yeah, I mean, I think that's, there's a lot there, but part of me thinks it's actually not that hard to break into the cathedral because, and it's just that the conservatives are very bad at everything. I mean, it, it, it's sort of like, you know, it's like, okay, so like I've been published in the New York Times, I've been published in the Washington Post. I am not. I was surprised, like when this happened. <laughs> like, do they look yeah. at my Twitter feed? Like, I'm surprised that, like, you know, people sort of pay, uh, you know, a lot of left wing people pay attention to me. But you know, because I'm smart and I have something to say, people want to hear it. I think a lot of people think they're canceled, and the reason they're canceled is because they're not interesting or smart or don't have anything to say. And they'll say, "Oh, it's because I'm so right wing." I think that a lot of liberals want to hear from intelligent conservatives. They just don't find, you know, Jack Posobiec that that interesting, right? Um, or, you know, like Alex Jones, like they find him interesting for like other reasons, but they don't like see him as like a person with ideas that they, you know, that they would be interested in grappling with. I mean, there's like, you see these like, uh, these like uh, long like articles in like the New Republic and Vanity Fair about the new right, just like anybody who's like claiming to do anything intellectual on the right, it just like, you know, they, they, they're drawn to it like moths to a flame. And, you know, and, and so sometimes I wonder, like, maybe it is actually easy. There's just the, you know, the sort of, but you know, it's easy if you're, you know, there is an opening there. It's just the kinds of people who've become conservatives um, and who've been the most visible conservatives aren't the people to do it. And for reasons in, that have to do with their inherent flaws, rather than reasons having to do with, you know, them being too edgy or having uh, views that liberals don't like. Yeah, I, I think there is certainly something to what you say. Um, you know, I, I think what maybe you're, you're dancing around is that conservatives seem to be very, or they seem to be lower IQ on average. In certain I don't know if that's around that. I've read, yeah, I've written, I've written. I mean, I mean, that, yeah. yeah. And, 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 and just, and, and, and one could argue more prone to a certain kind of fanatical conspiracizing. Um, I think the left right, is prone yeah. to its own sort of conspiracies, um, and I really don't want to let them off the hook. But look, you know, there, there is a difference between maybe, we, I know on the right we like to call systemic racism a conspiracy theory, and in some ways I, sure, you can, you can call it that. But it's not, yeah. it's not quite the same thing as, you know, extreme example, but like Hillary Clinton sucking the blood of children. Sure, there, there's right. a bit of an asymmetry yeah. there. Happy to concede that. That said, you know, I, like, some of it may be too that the kinds of people on the right who could do this work competently and are sane uh, tend to either voluntarily choose to do other things that will make them more money right? Like, you can make more money as a high-powered lawyer, you know, in the Federalist Society, or uh, as an investment banker than you can as a journalist. That's that's one problem. Um, and conservatives tend to, for whatever reason, care more about, about that. Uh, and then I think the other, maybe too, that there, I, I also think there's a dynamic where some of the smarter conservatives uh have been so repulsed by trump um that they've either become liberals or you know they don't like to they, they, for a number of reasons they don't feel like they have the moral standing to really go after the the left on some of these cultural issues um i don't i, I don't think you can just blame trump for that that's not what i'm saying of course there's also an entire you know again, ecosystem of, of media interests that tries to paint all opposition to wokeism as racist, whatever. Okay, fine. That said, I, I think that uh, if, if, if the past six years uh, had been different, um, I think that some of the people who have really kind of just on the on the alleged right, who've sort of given up the culture war. I, I'm I'm not sure they would have. I mean, I, I I do think that some of this stuff is more contingent than we give it credit for, and uh, it's really hard to know what would have happened if 2016, for example, went a different way. 
So the, yeah, so this is yeah, so this gets to something yeah I wanted to ask you, um, which is you know is 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 something that you know to, to what extent should people on the right sort of take an active role? You know, if it's the if it's true that uh, Trumpism, uh, certain parts of populism, anti-vax, stop the steal, uh, this QAnon, like the, the extent that that stuff draw. Uh, pushes um, smart people away from center-right ideas. To what extent is it a good idea to just sort of push back against that? I mean, like, you know, you could, I, I'm surprised. Like, it's like people push back against Trumpism. Like, there's, you know, they, they'll go and they'll just become like Jennifer Rubin. They'll just become Democrats. And like, you know, there's, and like, there's just, there is a space where you could say critical race theory is bad. You know, you could say feminism is bad. You could say, you know, all kinds of these, you know, these right-wing ideas and you can, you know, you can be strong on these things. I think Ann Cole or someone who who does this and she's lost lost a lot of i think uh influence and maybe this is why more people don't do it but who's also like stands up to what she would call the retard right um you know she's all she's pro-vax she's you know anti-stop the steal she's you know she's against a lot of the a lot of trump's shenanigans um and so yeah i mean why do you think more people don't sort of take that position did i just answer my own question is it just sort of just their <laughs> it's just like, well no i think that's part of it but but let me add add, a, add another dimension that i that i think isn't talked about enough which is the the in the political arena specifically the the primary system right and i think this goes for both sides actually but we've we've really introduced it, too much democracy into the way that we pick candidates for the major parties um and especially in the age of populism, it's it's hard to sometimes push back against this. But look, I, I mean, the people who are voting in these primaries usually are not, they're not the average American. They're, they're a group of extra motivated kind of hardcore partisans. And this this is true on both sides. It's, there, it's not an exact symmetry, but like, you know, primary Democrat voters and primary Republican voters are not... Uh, necessarily representative of uh, the the country and and not even of of their wider party. Um, and that is a structural problem that I think really should be addressed, but in part because of the prevailing cultural and ideological winds, no one wants to just come out and say, look, primary voters, including Trump voters, should have less power to pick the nominees of major parties. Uh, and and the re and, and I mean, look, the reason they should have less power is not because they deserve to be disenfranchised or because their concerns don't matter. It's because, in general, ideologic, very ideological people who are motivated to vote in these primaries just tend to elect candidates who are more out there and who are not going to be as good at governing and who are not going to represent a wide cross section of people and. I mean, look, I'll just say for the record, if, you know, if the RNC tomorrow decided we're going to make DeSantis the nominee and just throw out, you know, just sort of not do primaries, uh, change all the rules, there might be prudential reasons not to do that. But in principle, I would have no issue with it. And I and I think that people on the right should just be more OK with uh subverting subverting democracy in the primary process if it helps them win in general elections and if it helps them actually govern the country i i just find this fetishization of the each party's most hardcore base of activists just very self-destructive and stupid yeah and it seems much more uh, so but it's, it seems to be much worse uh on the right as far as maybe not as ideal maybe the left is picking some ideologically extreme candidates, but as far as being, you know, less intelligent and self-destructive. Yes, and not yes good candidates. I agree. I agree. Do you, I mean, are you, you can old? say what you want about like Elizabeth Warren. I, I hate her, but you know, Elizabeth Warren is not, it, 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 she's not compare she's Elizabeth not Warren to like, you know, Trump or even, or Kanye or whoever it is now that we're, we're talking about. Yeah. Are you old enough to remember the 2012 primary, like the Republican primary? Were you paying attention? Uh, not, not super closely. I mean, yeah. Well, it's funny. So, so like Trump comes in 2016 and he, he wins the primary, but in 2012, like Trump was leading the polls, like he didn't end up running, but he was leading the polls for a really long time. And the only, his only issue, the only thing he was known for at the time was birtherism. <laughs> like the only thing, like he was on news all the time, just talking about Obama's birth certificate. And then when the primary started, it went through these cycles where like 
Herman Cain like had a brief run. I, I don't know if you ever seen Herman Cain speak. He's not not a very wasn't a very smart man. God rest his soul. Um, Michelle Bachman was like near the top for, or top for a while. Newt Gingrich like was the you know was the was the like last man standing against Romney. And then finally they settled on Romney. But it was like they were so desperate to like pick a crazy person, and they were just like sort of floating around from one crazy person uh, to the next. And then they got their you know their favorite crazy person in 2016, Trump. They got the king of you know the kid the the guy who they had the most connection to. But there is. Yeah, something odd going on with the Republican voters. Um, and yeah, I think that, you know, the, sort of the talk radio, the, 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 uh, the cable news sort of now it's like, now it's like Facebook and like these fake news websites. I think they've, I think they've just taken over the primary voter. And so, you know, it's, it's not even the primary voter. It's like if the poly, you know, it's maybe it is, maybe it is, maybe you're right. Maybe it is just the primary system because if you could fix that, you could just ignore these people and you could have just sort of elites run things. Uh, but yeah, something, you know, something I think deeper in the culture has gotten I mean, wrong. Technology that. also probably plays some role in this, right? It's just harder to, when, when, when people have access to more information or disinformation as it were, and it's all floating around on social media, that itself may make it harder to implement the kind of anti-democratic reforms I'd like to see because they'll be blasted all over social media and then that will create, right? Right, right. Like once in, in t- once, it, once you're in the system, the, the more democratic system, you kind of have to uh, respond to the voices of the people which are amplified by... Uh, social media and technology, at least the most crazy voices. And that's probably a, a obstacle uh, to the kind of change we might both like to see. But yeah, I, I, I mean, I just bring this up to, to, to show that there, we, we should at least be willing to think about what the structural determinants are behind this and, and not just hand wave it away as the GOP voters are just crazy. I mean, I guess it, that may be true, but I, I just don't think it's super productive to uh, uh, hand wave in that way. Um, it doesn't really get us closer to solving the problem. Yeah. problem. yeah, I think thinking about the technology is interesting. There was this recent article uh, in this that made the rounds. I forget what I forget what publication, but it was about like the fairness doctrine and the decline of fairness doctrine, what happened to the media. Do you happen to see this? I haven't seen the article, but I'm familiar with the fairness doctrine. Yeah, it was something about how John Stewart. It was it was actually it framed as about John Stewart, but it was I, mean, I think it was all about it, the media technology more more generally. And the you know the the, the you know I, I'm not an expert in this. I've done deep research on the fairness doctrine, but the idea was like you would you would uh, uh, you would have to give equal time to like political commentary, right? And you know what that was was just like it made it sort of. I think it probably had an effect of just making things boring. Um, you know, it's like you could have Rush Limbaugh, or you, you know, I, I think you would probably just minimize. You know, you're, what, what are the odds you're going to find uh, somebody who could speak as long as Rush Limbaugh and be and be as interesting, right? Um, the liberal throughout. So you would just probably camp, clap down political content, make it as probably middle of road as as possible. And you know, just reading this, I think maybe like maybe this, you need something like that. I mean, it's not consistent with like libertarian or conservative principles in any way that you know the government is regulating uh, speech in this way. Um, but yeah, I just sort of see this, I just see sort of this spiraling of like, yeah, stupidity. Now, maybe, now maybe, maybe there's a chance that, uh, uh, 2022, this last election shocks the Republican voter in the, into them being interested in electability. Like that, that's potentially like something they could just go for moderate, more moderate candidates. Potentially, when Trump goes away, this could be. But like Trump seems healthy to me. I mean, I think he'll be a force for. I think he'll be a force for the next fifteen years. So I don't think. I don't think you can. Uh, you can uh, count on that. Um, but yeah, I, I think that it, thinking about sort of like what kind of like a conservative vision of like what has gone wrong and what could actually be a fix here. I think. So, I think somebody developing those ideas would be would be pretty interesting. Ultimately, part of the problem here uh, is that. The modern world requires a certain level of technocratic administration. It just does. And American political culture is quite libertarian. Um, It's a bit, and especially on the right, it's quite libertarian. Uh, It has always had kind of a thing for... uh, 
un untutored populists. Um, and the truth is that uh, this is not a popular thing for conservatives to say, but like we kind of, you know, you need, you need right wing, you need the right wing version of Elizabeth Warren, right? You do need people who understand how the law works um, and the ins and outs of various policies and regulatory agencies uh, to, but who also understand the way that progressives have abused those agencies, the way in which much of alleged expertise is actually just fake and nonsense. Um, that's really what you need if you want to actually govern uh, on the right in an effective way. And I just don't... I don't really see a, a big infrastructure dedicated to producing those kinds of people. Um, it's funny. I think that your, and to some extent, my diagnosis of the problem, in a way, everything we've been saying, we, we've basically been agreeing with a lot of liberals. Like we're saying that Republicans are in the grips of disinformation, that they're kind of stupid, and that giving them all this authority, you know, given, giving the so-called rubes, all this, you know, authority has been bad. I think where we depart from the left is we recognize that uh, the current crop of technocrats uh, is fundamentally it, it broken. Um, and, you know, what we really want is like a, a kind of center-right counter elites that, uh, you know, uses technocrats you know, effective technocratic administration to uh, govern well and to kind of get rid of a lot of the pathologies of progressive governance, not to just sort of surrender on the project of governing entirely. Yeah, I think I, I think I'm, I'm maybe I'm a little bit more, I mean, I agree with a lot of the diagnosis. I think more about, I think I might be lean towards more surrendering on government entirely. I mean, I think, I think I'm more libertarian maybe, maybe than maybe. you are, but, but I think where we would agree is it's the, not necessarily has to be technocratic, but you have to, even to get to liber to get to more libertarianism, you would need somebody who knows the laws and knows like, well, yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, I mean, I mean, look like Singapore in many ways, you know, on, on, I look, you know more about this than I do, but my understanding is Singapore is very free market in, in how it works. Right. But, but it, Part of why Singapore works is because they, and I'm not endorsing we become like Singapore. There's, I, you know, I do want there to be democracy. Singapore's not really a democracy, but, but still, uh, you know, even the robust libertarianism does require the state to do some things well. And getting to the, the libertarian equilibrium requires, yes, it requires you to know the law and know about technocratic things, right? Even if your vision for governance isn't technocratic. Once you have a technocracy, you're not really going to undo it without some kind of technocrats of your own. I just think that's unrealistic. Yeah. Could, could I, I say do... one more? Yeah, go oh, ahead. Go ahead. Okay, well, no, so, no. So, so the other thing I wanted to say, because um, we've been we've been talking, I want to uh, throw another olive branch to the left and reflect on it a bit. And I'm curious what your thoughts are on this. Um, part of what's frustrated me about Trump's uh, hold on the Republican Party is that fundamentally it's just not the case that he's the voice of the people because he never won the popular vote and I don't I'm not one of these people who thinks the electoral college is evil and Republicans can't what, what you know no but 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 ultimately at, at a very basic level it, the voice of the it, it is senseless to say that someone speaks for the real voice of the people if they can't, if they can't win the popular vote, it's kind of, it's stupid, right? Trump never won the popular vote and he only managed to win the electoral college when he was up against the most unpopular democratic presidential nominee in modern history. The idea that an authentic populism would make, would have as its standard bearer, someone like that is just foolish. It's, it's based on a kind of a, a, it seems to me a foundational conceptual confusion about what democracy even is but so, I, don't, I don't know many, yeah i don't know many conservatives who like trump for that yeah there's some who watch newsmax and who think he's like you know has a 90 percent approval rating but like the people yeah I but 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 i i i would I, well 
but I'll say this. I mean, I'm not sure that that's really what a lot of more elite conservatives think, but I hear the rhetoric from them a lot where it's like, oh, well, you know, Trump was speaking for this forgotten man. But, but, but really what's going on is that Trump spoke for a important set of minority interests in society that do have a legitimate claim, right, to, to have their to be taken seriously. But fundamentally, Trump supporters as a group are a political minority. And, yeah, you know, but, but smart, and I just think the smart version of this is that they're deferring to the Republican voters. So the primary, it's not about the majority of the population. If Trump has the most and the most enthusiastic support, um, I think that's that's the argument. And you hear this from a lot yeah. of congressmen who are from regions that where people worship Trump. And they'll, you know, they'll say stuff like, I just have to sort of go along with whatever, whatever he says. So I, th I think that's, I think that's the argument. I think they feel sort of trapped or. Yeah, or but I think, I think that's, but that's just it. it. It's, they're trapped because of the dynamic, both the, the structural dynamics of the way our, our electoral system works and, and the cultural dynamics. They are, they're trapped in supporting someone who cannot credibly claim to represent a majority of the country. And what bothers me about some of the populist rhetoric on the right is I think it it's allowed a lot of conservative elites to 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 forestall asking themselves some hard questions about what a uh, uh, actual democratic conservatism would look like, right? I think that that conservative that that real populism would be would result in a kind of uh, some pretty reactionary stances, frankly, on social issues, or at least more right wing ones, right? As as you pointed out, most voters don't like affirmative action, right? But it's also the case that most voters don't really want to live in the world that I think uh, a lot of the sort of elite Catholic conservatives want to live in, right? They don't want to live in, and they don't want to live in in Donald Trump's world. So so. Yeah, so the, I, just, I just find it frustrating because because if, if we're going to talk about what would be popular and represent the voice of the people, it's not what the left says, but it's also really not what the institutional right says. So, you know, yeah, I mean, that's to channel some of my, you know, smarter just Trump supporting friends, people, a lot of them you probably know. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's always some something along the lines of I mean, they have an electoral argument that I don't think is crazy i think it's wrong but i don't think it's crazy I, i'm not 100 percent sure it's wrong it's like you know trump ha is uh has the sort of uh uh, uh sort of the um for the uh, for the electoral college he has like the perfect distribution of support <laughs> to potentially win the presidency right and so there's like a pragmatic case of like why trump can win and desantis can i don't think that's necessarily true i think desantis could could probably win but it's it's not it's not crazy that you know, he might not be able sure, to win sure. uh, the Midwest state. He might not be able to win this Midwest state that Trump Trump won in 2016. Um, and then there's, you know, the idea, and I think this is like more dated than like the Trump, it's like sort of flight 93 election. It's like everyone else, you know, is going to be sort of like, you know, putting their finger to the wind and tr trying to like, you know, be able to be bullied by the media. I think that was like maybe something you could believe in 2015, 2016, I think believing now that like Ron DeSantis is like listening to like the New York Times on like education yeah. issues or civil rights issues, I think that's less and less credible. I think that makes less and less sense. I think people who still stick to that view are are sort of uh uh you know I, I think they're delusional. <laughs> I think they're just used yeah, to yeah. I, know, I agree. They can't adjust their uh the you know I their, agree. Their priorities on this. Um, well, I yeah, guess I yeah. guess my point it, my point is is not so much. I'm not so much talking about the question of whether Trump could win. I'm talking about the question of democratic legitimacy and kind of having a mandate to really do things once and yeah. ever. I mean, look, yeah. I, as as I've as I've said it throughout this conversation, I'm I'm not necessarily a principled small D Democrat. I don't necessarily care as much about the people having a voice as I do about things just being governed well, but. If you are going to invoke these kind of democratic populist values, as a lot of people on the right do, then I think it's very dishonest to not address the elephant in the room, which is that uh, 
the voice of the people really is not calling for uh, Donald Trump. Um, yeah. I think, and, I think trying to catch the populace in a contradiction, I think is sort of a, it's sort of a it's shooting fish in a barrel. <laughs> like, I think you can, like, you know, these Catholic traditionalists, do they care that abortion is, um, you know, that people don't c- agree with them on abortion? No, they, they don't care. Um, you know, they'll say, Oh, you know, the people want, that's fine. I, I mean, look, that's, that's fine. I just, I just, and this is, this isn't, this is just me sort of being a bit autistic and really disliking kind of dishonesty. I just wish people would, I just wish people would be upfront about what they think. And, and, and I do think, you know, as you've, you've yourself argued, I think correctly that one thing though, that does hamstring the right is when people can smell the lack of sincerity, right? Like when conservatives pretend to care about title nine, a law that they hated until two minutes ago, because suddenly Title IX is like a you know women's sports is a cudgel to to fight back against trans. Yeah, you know, I think people can kind of sense that that's silly and dishonest, and I don't think it really works all that well. Um, and I guess I I have a sort of similar worry about the Trump populism stuff that that these appeals to oh, the voice of the people it just it's 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 so transparently bullshit that I'm not sure it even is effective for what I want. And so I'd rather them uh, actually give more thought to what really would be effective. And I think that that is candidly um, a mix of kind of cultural, cultural conservatism on some issues, um, but also, you know, cultural compromise or even surrender on others. And, and like in, I don't have any grudge against, look, I'm not even, I don't even think it would be wise to totally surrender the abortion thing to the left because most people don't actually want abortion on demand, but they also don't want what a lot of pro-life activists want. Um, And objectively speaking, if you want to fight back against affirmative action and have a winning coalition on some of these identity race issues, it would be a lot easier to do that if you did what Ron DeSantis did and just settled for a 15-week abortion ban and did not try to do what some of these other states have tried to do, right? It, it would actually be good for the forces of kind of colorblindness if the Republican Party would distance itself from the most extreme pro-life activists. And I, I do hope that they start to do that what, now that the Democratic forces are at play because Roe's been overturned. But, you know, we'll have to see. Yeah. I mean, sometimes it's just the confusion comes from people you know, we call people conservatives or Republicans or whatever, and they prioritize different things. Like me and you dislike affirmative action, race consciousness. We're not, you know, rabid pro-lifers. Somebody else, they might just care about abortion, and they, you know, they'll 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 sacrifice on race stuff. You know, they'll they'll try to be, you know, they'll, yeah. they'll be yeah. PC yeah. in order to get try to get their abortion thing. So that's that's a lot of it. Sure. You know, and you know, on that note, sort of, how did you become like? um you know, what sort of motivated you of all the things you could focus on journalistically? Why focus on the race and identity issues? You talk a little bit about that in your experience at college. What convinced you? Started yeah, of course. Really important? Um, I think the race stuff really is the beating heart of wokeness. When you just look at what these college protests are about, what tends to command the most force in elite institutions, um, that is the issue where the, the, the kind of woke taboos are the strongest. And so I think, it, you know, if, 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 you, if you see wokeness as a kind of broader uh, political or even theological, as some people like to call it, belief system, the core of that theology really is race and disparate impact and then sort of race conscious policies to remedy disparate impacts. Um, so, I, I mean, just, just if you, I think if you just diagnose the kind of structure and system correctly, you will see that this is really the the glue that holds a lot of it together. In terms of what personally motivates me, let me put it this way. Um, I'm actually not like dogmatically opposed to affirmative action in all cases. If you gave me really good evidence that it worked and had and and had good pro-social outcomes, you know, I don't necessarily think that the, that, that there's some natural law that we must never, ever factor race into account in any of our decisions. I really wouldn't say that. But when you look at how it operates in practice, you just find out about what these preferences really are in the real world. It's so, so much more extreme than the defenders of it pretend. 
right? It's not that it's just a plus factor when you hold everything else equal. It's that race is equivalent to like, you know, 15, 20 LSAT points. And, and at a certain, at a certain point, we just have, I think most people think there's just no good justification for that unless you can show that all this affirmative action has really helped um, correct some pressing social inequality and made America better. And I just don't think that the evidence for that is there. Uh, so the benefits are very small and the costs seem to be very large. One being that it just offends a kind of intrinsic sense of fairness, but the other being that I think it, and in many ways, this is what I care more about. It, I think, stokes racial division. It makes our division, it makes our racial politics worse. It, it does mean that in that, frankly, some incompetent people get elevated who really shouldn't be, right? There's only so much affirmative action you can do in medical school before it affects the quality of of medical school graduates, right? And how, if you want just like a basic, well-functioning society uh, where people get along and where uh, you're treated by qualified people, uh, I don't think that injecting race consciousness into every single level, level of the admissions and hiring process in every elite profession is a good idea. I mean, it's kind of a pragmatic argument, but like, that's, yeah. that's the main thing. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, I think that, that all makes, that all makes sense. You know, I, I think the, um, you know, I have thought a lot about sort of, you know, cause there's a lot of anti-meritocratic stuff out there, right? I wrote about sort of age discrimination laws, right? Which people don't talk about, but I think is actually huge. You know, I think labor laws in general, just making people hard to fire, just giving them a incumbency advantage. If like somebody wants to do the job more efficiently and better, we say, you know, we, we put up barriers. So yeah, I think the, the, the problem of, you know, SCS sort of is the problem of a uh, lack of merit, um, you know, lack of merit more generally, and just people sort of wanting to micromanage these outcomes let me ask you what do you what do you do you have a theory as to why medicine has gone um so crazy um relative to a lot of other fields um well i think law has gone pretty crazy too but it hasn't gone as crazy and if we were just going to compare the two one reason for that may be that lawyers still do have to learn to argue and debate um in in a way just to do their jobs right in a way that really medical people don't um it's just not part of the job description uh i i think medicine it, it, it's it's perhaps more contingent than people realize some of this is because the field of public health has always been very left wing and very focused on social the so-called social determinants of health. That's really like, I mean, I mean, the central premise of public health is that personal medical outcomes are the function inter alia of social conditions. Oh, I didn't and know that. that. So um, public health, I, I just, I that's just noticed always public health been, during COVID. It, it, yeah. Public health didn't, it, yeah, it be, that's how it began, right, in the 19th so the whole century. Field as is a just broke so the, yeah, so, well, I mean, so, so, so look, I mean, obviously the, the idea that social conditions can affect health outcomes is like a totally reasonable idea and it's not crazy to study that but it but it's right it, it, the, you can e see how that kind of premise is just going to predispose the field towards being more lefty yeah and and so, I think yeah so that's if you want to know why are people fat for example like if you just had regular medicine they might look at like indoctrine you know endocrines and like their uh how much they eat and like behavior if you're yeah. public health i could see how like oh it's a public issue it just sort of right like, right it's just it's, yeah it's just the right. logic it's just the logic of the discipline yeah no i i think that's a big part of it um yeah and and look i mean you know the, there also is something to be said for the idea that uh, people will, people do tend to be more sympathetic, I think, to woke, woke ideas when there are very, very large and disturbing disparities to point to. And there are some <laughs> in medicine, like, look, just objectively, right, there are some pretty big health disparities that it's, it's, it's hard to look at and think, oh, yeah, that's great and fine, right? It, it's a totally normal reaction. To, to, to think, oh, wow, you know, this group is really doing so much more unhealthy than this other group. Isn't that just kind of sad? Don't we want to yeah. help that?
group. That's fine, but you know, it, it does lend itself to it, it makes it much easier for uh purveyors of race conscious policy to, you know, frame that as the solution when when in fact I I would know not that I'd necessarily support it if it even if it worked, but it does not in fact appear to work, right? In in Utah they tried to allocate that they gave race a, a fair amount of weight in their allocation scheme for COVID drugs. And in one of my pieces, you know, what, what they, the health department or, or the, the governor's office, I think actually said was that they were finding that this race conscious policy wasn't actually getting the COVID drugs to minorities who needed it. Mm -hmm. So it didn't even work. All it did was it meant that white people had a harder, who needed the drugs had a harder time getting them. It didn't actually mean that minorities who needed them got them. Um, so like, Right. And and you ask, well, again, this goes back to why I oppose it in the first place. Well, like it, all it really do, did was probably hurt white people and not help black people. Yeah. So it wasn't like it's like there's no respect in which this policy made anybody better off. Right. So, I mean, you know, I'm if, if they wanted to do targeted outreach in minority communities and told them, hey, like really get vaccinated or something, that seems like it might work and that would be fine but that's not what they did and what they did clearly did not accomplish their objectives yeah so i have i have a theory about medicine i think this applies to academia too i think <clears throat> wokeness has become sort of the the standard sort of ideology um and you know there's just this, like the unthinking person who just like accepts everything like that the media or or the, public education tells them, right? And I think that fields where you have to jump through a lot of arbitrary hoops, I think tend to draw people who are, uh, you know, not woke, maybe not inherently woke, just inherently conformist and inherently status obsessed. So academia is like this. You know, I think that academia, <clears throat> one of the biggest mistakes we made is, you know, we made agreeability, agreeableness so it's such a big part of it. Like you have to get along with others, tenure, and all that, all that stuff. When I think disagreeableness is actually the best thing for a scholar or somebody uh, searching for truth, um, I think I, you know, medical professionals they're you know, uh, they're going to uh, medical school for a long time. You know, I, I don't remember six years. It's like six years, and then you have a residency where you're still not officially a doctor for years after that. Just tons and tons of hoops to jump through, um, and it seems to me like that's gonna that's gonna draw a certain kind of person. That person. <laughs> person it's just yeah do whatever it takes to have to be to have the dr in front of their name and that, that, then, you know, i think that that there's a lot to that and it's it's a theory that could also explain some other fields so for example uh elite uh elite orchestras and other artistic uh fields have been artistic institutions have gone really really woke too and well, you know I wouldn't say they're necessarily arbitrary, but you do have to jump through a lot of hoops and kind of just do whatever is asked for you. Show up to auditions at any time, uh, practice for hours and hours on end, right? To say, be a, a really good clarinetist. Um, so there is probably, there is probably some selecting for conformist personalities in a lot of these high powered fields. Now, granted, I, I don't know if that, uh, I mean, there's other things like maybe law well law is pretty woke too uh i don't yeah. know finance i guess i guess interestingly venture capital seems to attract a lot of non-woke people yeah and venture exactly. capital yeah. often requires like a certain level of independent thinking and is not there's not as much of these sort of pre the, the sort of well-established cursus sonorum that everyone has to travel in order to be a venture capitalist yes. um it's, it's a little less regimented so that that that's another piece of evidence maybe for your theory that this is about you know, the structures of the profession selecting for certain kinds of personalities that are in turn disposed more or less towards wokeism. I think that's, I think that's right. And I have to sort of think about whether this is cons consistent with all the facts. Cause I know 30 years ago, like the AMA, for example, was considered a conservative organization. They came down more on the side of Republicans than Democrats, probably because of tort reform and maybe things like that. So it wasn't always like this. And medicine was always sort of a thing where you jumped through hoops, but who knows, maybe 30 years ago, like the most conformist thing to be might have been to be a center right Republican, right? The conformist thing wasn't to be woke, and now they're now they're still doing the conformist thing. Of course, interestingly, interestingly, within medicine, there's a lot of variation. So, like surgeons are more conservative, yeah. uh, but pediatricians are among the most liberal groups, yeah, and yeah, infectious yeah. disease doctors are the most liberal. It which again, like I think, yeah, and, and, 
Yeah, sure. I mean, I think it also, again, it, it, there can also be something about, as I said about public health, there, there can be, there can be sort of different disciplines can have almost different premises and logics that dispose the people in them to certain kinds of political conclusions. Like infectious disease is all about the spread of contagion among people. So it's inherently focused on social networks. It's inherently focused on how uh, social structures spread disease, which I think is just naturally going to dispose, for various reasons, infectious disease doctors to be more left wing, where surgery is an individual operating on another individual. Kind of makes sense to me that it produces a maybe more right wing mindset. That and the fact that surgeons get paid a ton of money, and so they have an incentive to want lower taxes. Yeah, and, I think know, doing things like, with your hands is, is inherently yeah, draws yeah, a certain yeah. kind of ma male, and the, the surgeon is just the highest end of that, right? Like the yes. guy who the guy who fixes stuff around my house, he's he's very conservative. Um, yes, so like that, that's, a good, that's, that's a good point. That's a good point. I think good that point. I think is the norm. Um, yes. yes. Uh, yeah, he's, he was an engineer. He worked for an engineer for some major aerospace company, but now he just likes to go to the national park. So he's, he's happy to just do odd jobs to, to get enough money to do that. Um, yeah. So, okay. So yeah, all that is, that's interesting. Uh, Aaron, are you, uh, so you, you said you know, earlier that your dream is to be in the, or was to be in the, in the take business. Are, are you sort of, have you had your fill of the, um, of the journalism thing, or do you feel like you have a lot of that left in you? Are you thinking about going towards something else or where I, are you? I still have a fair amount of it left in me. I, I would say that my long-term goal is to really do a mix and to do, to do the reporting. Cause as I've said, I think it's important and it's something that not enough people are doing, but I also want to combine the reporting with kind of more commentary and, and sort of use the reporting to build out, uh, a theory of wokeness and presume hopefully build out a theory that can help uh both well both generate testable predictions um right like any good theory should be able to uh and also help ultimately solve some of these problems uh i think uh it, the theories theories of what whatever to the extent that theories of wokeness are valuable things to have in our conceptual toolkit, they will be valuable because they track something true about the way wokeness operates. And that's what I think has really been missing in a lot of right-wing intellectual discourse for a while. I mean, I, I, we sort of got a breakthrough with Chris Caldwell's book on the, its civil rights and then your work on it. I mean, I do think there's now more interest in these kind of structuralist and legal explanations for wokeism, and I, I'm I'm sympathetic to them. But you know, think about, and I I, I should say disclaimer that I like Patrick Deneen and think he's interesting. But you know, his book on liberalism is an example of the kind of analysis that I think we have too much of, and that I think is is <laughs> on its own I not hate really. To hear you talk about someone you, whose work you don't like. <laughs> No, I, I don't. I, I, but look, I like a lot of aspects of it, and he has good observations. But I, I worry that there's a, and maybe I do think it's starting to to change. But for a while, there was this this very hand. And look, I did it too. But there there was this very hand wavy. Oh, it's about the decline of religion. It's about hyper individualism. Blah blah blah. And when you yeah. actually really ask pointed questions of these theories, like they just, they don't do a good job of accounting for what we really see in the real world. They're, they're underpowered. And I mean, they're also just kind of like, you know, A, I don't think it's true that John Locke is the reason that we have wokeness, even if in some sense it is true. It's like, so what? Like, we're not going to be able to do anything about that. John Locke was there, right? And we had the founding of the country we did. So I just... It may be interesting. It may be an important academic exercise, and maybe Patrick Deneen's theory of of what's gone wrong with America can help guide certain kinds of policies in the right direction. But on the culture war stuff, I, I at least the kind of you know identity politics, culture war stuff that I I care about, I just don't think it really it has many actionable upshots. Yeah. I, I um, agree. I agree with you. Yeah, I think this sort of these. Uh... Yeah, you know, there's a certain kinds, you know, there's thinkers who just like read a few philosophy books from people who lived, you know, hundreds or sometimes thousands of years ago. And then they sort of read the news and they think that like what these philosophers said in books is like there's a 
connection between that and like Lizzo becoming, you know, a famous, a famous uh, 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 rapper, singer, whatever, whatever Lizzo is. And it's like, it's like, no, I think you need like more detailed knowledge of sort of how society works. I sort of think like, you know, philosophers are like, you know, much more. I mean, if you look at how countries converge in sort of their behavior, like, you know, like technology, like economic growth, like, you know, a lot of developed countries end up looking the same and a lot of developing countries yeah. look, look the same and they go through stages because there's big economic and technological forces. It's not like, oh, Confucius said one thing, so the Chinese all did this. And then Martin Luther came and so Northern Europe did this. And yeah. then Muhammad yeah. was there. And so the Arabs, well, Muhammad, maybe it's closer to, <laughs> closer to reality for the Middle East. But mostly it's not just like these people just listen to philosophers. It's like, you know, society. Right. Well, and also, and also, even, I mean, you know, I, I, I haven't read it yet, but I saw you reviewed uh, the, the book about kind of why the West is unique and, and yeah. you know, talking about cousin marriage you know the yeah, Titanic, kind of cousin marriage people in the world. but that even that is an example where it's not so much that the ideology has some kind of natural logic to it it's that a very concrete prohibition implemented for sort of ideologically or theologically contingent reasons affects genetics and behavior in a way that then has outsized social effects in the long run i mean that that to me that's probably, I don't know how much it explains, but but a ban on cousin marriage seems like a better place to start explaining why, you know, say, Western countries tend to have certain characteristics in common than is saying, well, you know, because uh, Judeo-Christianity. Like, Judeo-Christianity, it's, just, it's too broad of a category to... Yeah, it's interesting. It's it's interesting, isn't this? Like, why is the like? Is there a left wing equivalent of this? Of like trying to explain like all of Americans and America and everything is wrong with America through through philosophy? Like, I I don't see liberals. They would say they would say that white supremacy is a kind of inchoate ideology. Yeah, they would say white supremacy is an idea, but they're like very focused on like process. Some of them, some of them would say capitalism or kind of a, a, a kind of. Or, or, or liberalism. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of their own equivalent of the Patrick Kinnean thesis. I, but the, uh, yeah, even, look, they, I, even their capitalism is, is more like the Heinrich thing because it's more like the capital wants to do this and it wants to do that. And like, even those people aren't like the mainstream of like the Democratic Party or liberal thought. But even that is not like Adam Smith's thought of capitalism. Therefore, like everything went wrong. Like, I don't hear them talk like that. Yeah, I, I know. I think you're right. I mean, it's certainly not as. I think on the left, those kinds of explanations are less mainstream. I, I think the closest, honestly, is that they they will say that a kind of racist ideology is somehow baked into our founding and that that explains. I mean, this is the 1619 Project, right? I guess you could say it was an institution they're blaming slavery. But I think I think it's very close. They see the institution as as both both kind of a product of and reinforcing a a white supremacist ideology that that now in the present day sometimes how explains all these disparities i i think that's the closest thing and look it's for the same reason i mean those kinds of explanations suffer from the same problems you know it's and it's it's not just that they they make a number of implausible empirical claims it's that just white supremacy it's just too it's become too vague and capacious a term to be operationalized in any kind of compelling explanation for for a, a, a discrete social phenomenon right it just becomes a catch-all like like the way some people use law or liberalism right just it's just not analytically very rigorous and that's look this is one of the things i don't like about both the post-liberal right and the woke left is is the tendency to uh rely on abstractions that don't actually explain it yeah, yeah, that's a good that's a good analogy. That's something I've been worrying of, wondering about a while. You know, why do why do conservatives seem to have this political philosophy understanding of the world? And you're right, and it's also you're right about how it's different. And that like slavery is not like one man bought of slavery or one man bought of capitalism. And these are still institutional theories. And now that I think about it, no, like there is actually I don't think they're equivalent, right? It's this, that's more like Heinrich. That's more like you know yeah scientific yeah theory. yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Like, the stuff that just it's came from somebody's brain. And like this sort of yeah. uh, religious thinkers in particular are really drawn to this, maybe just because they're religious. So they think like the human soul can be like motivated to do important things. And once you like, I, I guess it, it, maybe it's just religion, because if you think that like God gave you the truth, 
it's like uh, and like you have to follow the word of god then like somebody comes along and says something that's like opposite of the world word of god or like takes yeah. you away from it then you sort of think okay the ideas are the most important thing in the world so maybe it's just the fact that the religious thinkers are on the right and that that sort of yeah no that. and look and look i do think that uh the absence of religious belief i'm sure does affect how people behave and how institutions yeah. function right i mean no one's denying that to me the 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 question is okay but so why has there been that secularization right and is it just that the secular ideas won out in the marketplace of ideas because they're better and eh, i don't really buy that especially when you see you know how how kind of woke woke ideas that are every bit as sort of implausible oh, or I think, I think I do buy that. I don't think woke has won the marketplace. I don't think most people are woke. Sure. I, I think they've won institutions and they've had some Okay. Yeah. But it's, but it's, but, but, but clearly, my point is just clearly lots of people, clearly lots of, there's lots of secular people who believe things that, that, that they'll, they'll make arguments for why you shouldn't believe in God that, that arguably should undermine their own faith and all of their kind of woke commitments, but it doesn't because they're not consistent and people are putting too much stock in intellectual consistency when they, when they play with these explanations. Right. I mean, I don't think, you know, I, I yeah, like, like, like it's, it's, yeah, it, it obviously religion and ideas matter, but you know, you need, you need some deeper explanation for why yeah. this or that idea. I think that's right. And my civil, right, my civil rights stuff is like sort of the opposite end of that. It's like a lot of these things, nobody intended, nobody planned. It was just like yeah. some weird political compromise. And then like, it sort of took off on its own. So yeah, I lean towards almost like the exact opposite, like close yeah, to like all unintended yeah. consequences. And, and no, I, I agree. I mean, I, and I, one of the things that I, I've not written this essay, but I, I hope to one of these days that, that always strikes me in, in the literature about, civil rights and about kind of the development of woke bureaucracy is that especially the disparate impact stuff, these theories of institutional racism, a lot of it seems to have come about around the same time that these bureaucracies just started using disparate impact analysis more out of administrative convenience than anything else. Yeah. They were like, well, yeah, uh, you know, it's hard to prove intent. So uh, we'll do, we'll just yeah. look at outcomes, and the racial, right? And the racial categories, especially, you could see yeah. directly how they were just sort of arbitrarily made. And then they, they just, they would justify them. They would justify them and say, we studied this, yep. and, you know, and, and, but it would, it was based on nothing. John. Uh, yeah, Sprint, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And, and I mean, and I mean, and look, I, I think that that's, that kind of thing happens more than people realize. And, and look, maybe the other reason why, I'm just, this is totally speculative, but why maybe religious people don't, or, or conservatives don't, don't always like these explanations is that there is, there can be something a little unsatisfying about them, especially yes, if you really like, want like to like believe the that there's a kind of yeah. like unity and, exactly, and everything yeah. is explicable, right? It, it, you know, I think this goes on the left in some ways too, but like, you know, the idea that people just believe this stuff for, for totally contingent reasons it can it can it can offend a certain kind of like Leibnizian theological sensibility that that thinks that everything needs to be explained by some higher power or some causal chain that terminates in the prime mover it's like the reality is no there's just some there's a certain amount of just randomness to the universe and to our social system Aaron, um, do you see yourself as sort of a I, I see myself as I want to inspire people who maybe were in academia or who are maybe one foot out the door uh, to um, think about like there's other things you could do in the intellectual world. Do you see yourself as sort of inspiring the next generation of people to do the same kind of thing you're doing? Yeah, I, yes. I mean, I want, I'd like there to be more young right-wing reporters um, who, who cover this stuff. I, and I'd like people to 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 take these issues seriously. I think, frankly, taking the issue seriously is less of a problem now. A lot of people take wokeness seriously. The problem is getting smart people to both take it seriously and and do so in a way that is actually constructive. I, I will tell you, I I'm a bit torn. I'll, I'll be honest because I want to do that. At the same time, I think there's something, there, there's an inherent tension to this kind of right-wing impact journalism, if you want to call it that, because ultimately I do think that journalism should be about seeking the truth. And you lose a certain amount of your credibility if you have too overt of a, 
of an ideological agenda and orient everything you're doing around just telling a certain narrative. I mean, of course, right, I have my own views. I think those filter into my reporting. I'm not really shy about that. Everyone kind of knows that if they read The Free Beacon, they're going to get a particular uh, narrative that will not be fully unbiased, of course. But I, even in just like decisions I make about, you know, what words I use or how to frame things, I I often am thinking, well, you know, this comes across as, as too overtly partisan. Will that limit the reach? And I mean, I do, I do think that's a, a problem. And, and uh, just because the New York Times has shed its credibility by going really woke on certain issues, yeah, all that goes to show is that if you have a overtly partisan agenda, people won't trust you. Um, so I think there is a there's a deep challenge that conservative journalists need to navigate, which is on the one hand, they 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 are going to be operating with a certain kind of narrative and with certain political ends in the back of their mind. That's just inevitable. On the other hand, to accomplish their goals, I think they need to, they really do need to take a kind of facts first mindset and try to resist being too dominated by the desire to propagate a particular kind of narrative. Um, and that's tough. And I would say, I, I hope that, you know, above all, I can, I can model not just like good, you know, not just inspiring people to be anti-woke or whatever, but also like just, you know, good, somewhat good journalism where you, where you, you know, care about facts and don't overreach right beyond what the evidence will show. I don't pretend to be perfect at that, but I, but I think that's important. And I, and I, I maybe beat around the bush a little earlier, but I'll just say, you know, I, I have definitely seen conservative journalists, not, not at the free beacon, but at other places, uh, who just publish things that aren't like fact checked and aren't, aren't like aren't true and it's really bad um and it undermines i look it undermines the credibility with me there i'm not not gonna name names but i can think of people off the top of my head who if they report a really intense scoop on what some crazy woke school or whatever i'm like i you know you you made x y or z up so i'm not gonna i don't automatically trust this um and i think that's the other thing i i want to hold conservatives to a kind of higher standard and make them see not only that it's possible to go after this woke stuff, but that it's possible to do so with integrity and without sacrificing your basic commitment to the truth, right? And that's one reason that I I, I, I join you in bashing the anti-vaxxers and the other, I think you called it the, the pro-retard right. I mean, that's your term, but like, but like, look, no, the, I, retard, I, I, the retard right, they're not pro-retard. Right. The, the, retard, the retard right, I mean, I mean look, it's, it's, a, it's a crude term, but I, I yeah, I, 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 I do feel some obligation to bash it because if you don't, you just, eh. Yeah, some people you, aren't smart. They can't help themselves. But some people, I mean, some people know better. And I think those are the ones, yeah, you have to, you have to call out for this stuff. So yeah, you are, um, yeah, you've thought a lot about this sort of right way, you know, thinking about the right wing space, which there's not a lot of this. I mean, I, I like your, we didn't even mention your, uh, uh, your uh, uh, podcast with uh, Charles, I, which I listen to all the time called Institutionalized. It's like, to find a right wing show that's just like reflective on things is like odd. I mean, I listen to Ezra, Ezra Klein podcast. Sometimes I can't take it. Sometimes it's too stupid. He'll he'll interview some like poet that I, I can't listen to. But often it's like very good and very smart. And like I'm looking for more of like people who oh, are great. Like, crazy with this. I mean, who, I mean, shows. Yeah, like I mean, yeah, exactly. yeah that's yeah. honestly he's a good example of like what. It's a great example of the kind of mainstream journalism that I yeah. think more conservative. I'd like to see a right leading box. I'd like to see somebody who just like goes deep depth, goes into depth and thing, like explains to you well, like what the Biden. You'll, you'll notice. Is. You'll notice too that although institutionalized, just like Ezra interviews more liberals than conservatives, we interview more conservatives than liberals. But we have interviewed liberals. Like we will do that and try to engage with them, um, which is something that a lot of conservative journalists don't do, and that's a problem. Okay, so before I let you go, Aaron, so what I'm hearing is journalism for a while, the take, the take, uh, sort of turn into political commentary and social commentary. That's going to come later, if ever. Is, is, is that right? Yeah, eventually, eventually, the goal is to unify the two. Is the goal is to unify, but that's not not in the immediate immediate term. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, great talking to you, Aaron, and uh, yeah, until next time.
Alrighty, thank you so much.